right. Well, good morning, Salem. God is good. And all the time, it's uh, great to see you all here this morning as we gather together to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the Lord's Day, and it's a special day. Uh, it's always a special day on the Lord's Day for uh, His church to get together and to glorify and worship Him. It's also Communion Sunday, so it's a time that we get to go to the table and uh, worship the Lord through communion. It's the first Sunday of the month. And it's also a special Sunday because of some things happening after service here today. I'll talk more about that a little bit later in our service, but we're just very excited uh, for this day, and we're excited that you are here with us for worship. Again, our purpose here is to worship Christ. Before we get into our time of worship, we just have some announcements and some acknowledgments we want to share with you here this morning. Uh, announcements just to let you know what God is doing. Acknowledgements just to acknowledge some key folks and some great milestones here this upcoming week. As far as announcements go, this Wednesday, we are starting our new session of teachings for our midweek gathering. This happens on Wednesdays at 6 o'clock. We resumed our midweek gathering in the month of August, but we didn't dive right into a teaching. We knew that August was still vacation time, other obligations people have, and so we just spent time in prayer and worship, and it's been a great month of just praying and worshiping the Lord on Wednesdays, but now we're ready to dive into our next and final teaching session of our theme. Our whole theme all year has been on evangelism, how we can practically evangelize. And I'm excited for this last teaching session because I think this is the one that everyone's really been waiting for because we're going to talk about exactly how we should evangelize. What should we do when we get those questions like, why is there evil in this world? What should we do when we get questions like, why do you feel Christianity is, is the right religion and all the others are wrong? How to write up a testimony and share a testimony that could be effective and powerful. Talk about some other evangelistic strategies that maybe you've heard of before, like Romans Road. How do we do that? What questions should we ask? How should we start these dialogues and conversations? These are just some of the things that we're going to be tackling here on Wednesday night, starting this Wednesday. We're going to be meeting in our Family Life Center, which is our gym. We're meeting down there for various reasons. Doors will open at 5.30, like we've always done in the past. If you want to come early and bring your dinner with you, some of us like to do that. We like to eat and kind of break bread. And at 6 o'clock, the study will start. We are going to stream the study, as we always do, on Facebook and save it on Facebook for those where Wednesday night just doesn't work well with your timing. That said, I'm not trying to guilt you to come in person, but if you're someone that watches it live and therefore has the time to come in person, you're going to want to come in person for this session because there is so much role playing we're doing. There's a lot of practical things we're doing. You're not going to get the fullness of the teaching on a computer screen. So if you could be here in person, I encourage you. If, again, you can't be here, maybe you have obligations at that time frame, that's the only time you can do it, then fine. I think you will learn some things, but the best way to really learn is to be here in person. So that is this Wednesday at 6 o'clock in our Family Life Center. This afternoon, after our Sunday School Discipleship Gathering Hour, there is a mission and outreach meeting in our Family Life Center as well. We want to talk about some things that are happening here in the next few months as far as our outreach and mission goes. For example, some of the things we're going to talk about is the Thanksgiving meals that we give to families in need, as well as the Christmas presents that we give to children that come from families in need. So these are just some of the things we're going to talk about. This is open to anyone in the church, not just those in outreach and missions. And so if you want to come and hear and maybe give us some insight, some ideas that you might have, we invite you to come. It's going to be a brief meeting. There are going to be some refreshments. So again, that's going to be after Sunday school discipleship gatherings around noon in our Family Life Center. Uh, Sandy and, and Shelly want me to let you guys know that on September the 20th, which is a Wednesday, there's a worship planning committee or worship committee meeting uh, that night at 7 o'clock Wednesday. So following our midweek gathering, I guess we'll be in the Hoffman Room. So that's where we'll meet for that meeting. Want to let you guys know about that. Then if this upcoming Saturday is the first of our two festivals that we have. These festivals have been going on since, what, six decades, maybe more? Longer than that? Okay, longer than that. So longer than probably a lot of us have been alive here. So this is a, a, an annual thing here at Salem. And uh, if you can help in any way, shape, or form, be here Saturday morning, sometime in the morning to help out. There are some specific things we need. We need someone to donate drinks. We need folks to donate some side dishes. And so if you can do either one of those things and even serve those things, 
see JD right here. Uh, he can get you signed up, let you know what we need as far as side dishes and drinks and all of that. And again, many hands equal light work if you could come and serve. If you can't come and serve, then at least come here at noon and buy the food. It's delicious food. It all, uh, it all goes to right to the ministry of what God is doing. We don't pocket the money or anything like that uh, for ourselves. And so come support what God is doing and so come support some great fellowship and some great food. So that is the first one is this upcoming Saturday, uh, September the 9th, okay? So there's other things to read about. We have grief share gatherings, start senior fellowship, youth ministry, read the back of the calendar. There's just a lot of things going on within our church family. Make sure you stay in the loop of what's happening. Just want to acknowledge some folks and some birthdays and anniversaries here this week. Uh, Dorothy uh, and celebrating a birthday. Her and her husband have started their travels now. They kind of, for, for a season, I guess you would say they're kind of like snowbirds. They kind of leave for a time period. So they're in their travels. But she's celebrating a birthday here. Uh, today actually is her birthday. Tomorrow, Florence is celebrating a birthday. And I didn't realize this until her and I were talking late last week. It is her 70th birthday. Sorry, am I not supposed to say that? But I am going to say it. So 70th birthday for Florence. I told her, she don't look 70 at all. She had me fooled. And so happy birthday, your 70th. I know you, you celebrate with your family over the weekend and all, so happy birthday to you. Other birthdays as well this week is Ernie Barnhart, Anthony Shives, uh, Grace celebrating a birthday this week. Happy birthday. Brindley Cheney, little Brindley up there celebrating a birthday. I see you up there. Uh, Scott Lesher celebrating a birthday. And Chase Starlipper celebrating a birthday as well. And we do have an anniversary. So we do have an anniversary that we can sing that this week. And that is Doyle and Patty Sowers. Uh, Doyle, where is that fantastic jacket you're wearing, and how many years? 40. 40 years. All right, congratulations to you guys, 40 years. Are there any other birthdays or anniversaries we could be missing in our notes here? Yes. How many years? 27. 27. Today is it? The 7th. Seventh. Seventh. All right, happy anniversary to you all as well, the bars. Any others? All right. Well, again, we have both birthdays and anniversaries, so let's say that to those who are celebrating one this week. Happy birthday to you. prepare our hearts for worship today. We want to draw our attention to God's word. And this morning, Richard is going to be reading for us our call to worship. I'm old. I can't do electronics. Today's call to worship is uh, found in Isaiah 53, verse 5. Here's the reading of God's word. But he was pierced through our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. His chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. Let's take a moment and meditate over this verse as we prepare our hearts for worship.
Amen. With our hearts ready for worship here this morning, I invite you to stand. We're going to sing a couple hymns, a couple songs to the Lord, also a prayer here. So let's stand as we sing and worship to him. Lord, we are here today to worship you, to crown you, Lord, to acknowledge you as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, to give you the glory, to give you the honor. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would pour into you who you are into us, Lord, and purify us in our hearts so that all that we do today, all that we worship we do today, could be done, Lord, with purity, could be done in spirit, could be done in truth. That again, you would be exalted. You would be the center of our time. And so, Spirit of God, move aside us. May we decrease so that you can increase. And again, may the cross be exalted. May we bask in your amazing grace here today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's sing our next song, Amazing Grace.
Man, you may be seated. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer here this morning, our prayer of intercession. And we're going to do things a little different here in our prayer of intercession time. We still will pray for the needs of a couple of folks that have uh, requested, requests that have been shared with me that we want to lift up. But we want to be intentional in our prayer time today to pray for this upcoming year in our discipleship gatherings, our Sunday school classes. As I mentioned during our announcement time, uh, this is a big Sunday. In many ways, we haven't formally been calling it this, but in many ways, this is our kickoff Sunday for our discipleship gatherings in Sunday school. We have a couple new things happening. Our adult classes are starting a new semester. This is their final semester of a three-year curriculum that we've been doing with them. And so each class is starting a new topic. And so for you adults, this is a perfect time to jump in on a class. Uh, you can read about those topics in your bulletin. Our children today are starting a brand new curriculum. They've been working on a curriculum called Dig In for almost about five years. And so we're starting a new curriculum here. And so not only is this Move Up Sunday, as we traditionally call it here, where the kids move to their new classrooms, but this is also an opportunity for them to start a brand new curriculum. And so we want to pray for that as well. And so we want to pray for this upcoming year. We want to pray for our teachers, acknowledge our teachers, pray for them, pray for our students, both adults and our children. And so I just want to briefly just share with you who these teachers are. We're going to have them stand, and we're going to intentionally, in this prayer of intercession, pray for these teachers, pray for all of us here in this new season of our discipleship gathering. So as I said, our adults are starting a new semester. These are new classes. Uh, they're, they're going to be teaching new topics. We have three adult classes that gather uh, every Sunday here. Uh, we have the class that meets in the upper room, which is across the hall, Pastor Bill, who's not here today. He's preaching over at St. Paul's. He's going to be leading that class. I'm going to fill in for just today, but Pastor Bill is going to be the leader of that class. And that class is going to be teaching on end times. And so if that's a topic that interests you, you're going to want to go to the upper room and join in that class. Then underneath the upper room, uh, called our Hoffman Room, if you come out these doors here, just go down the stairs, you'll, you'll just walk right into the Hoffman Room. And down there is another adult discipleship class, and that class is led by Amanda Sullivan, and she's leading a class called Worship and Mission. And they're going to explore what Scripture says, what biblical worship is. Not what man worship is, but what biblical worship is, and what is biblical mission. Another fantastic topic that they're going to be tackling. Uh, Amanda, if you don't mind staying in for us, we appreciate that. And then Joe, Janie, his class that he leads, that's down the Sunday school hall. So if you go through the Hoffman room, go up the stairs, you'll eventually be in the Sunday school hall. And that class is the adult class all the way down the hall on the left-hand side. And Joe's class is doing some pretty cool topics as well. Kingdom rule and church authority. Kingdom rule in that what is the kingdom of God? What is our involvement in the kingdom of God? And then church authority. What is the church? What's the involvement of the church? And what is the authority of the church? And so, Joe, if you could stand up. And if you guys don't mind, remain standing. I appreciate Appreciate that. So these are our new semesters of our adult classes. But again, as I said, our children are starting some new things as well. They're starting a brand new curriculum. Some things are going to change in our classroom sizes and dynamics and such, but we're very excited for this. One of the things that we're excited about is that we are, again, launching a nursery room. We haven't had a nursery room since COVID. And so we got a nursery room available for those who want to drop their little ones off in a very safe environment so you adults can go to a Sunday school class. And so what we have is we actually have 10 total volunteers for this. We have eight people in a rotation and two substitutes because we want to make sure there's always two adults in this classroom. So the 10 of you that have volunteered to serve, whether on a weekly or monthly basis or as our substitutes, if you can please stand for us at this time, I appreciate that. And then from there, we go from infants to our four- and five-year-olds. All right, there's more of you here, so please stand, our, our, our ten that are here. All right, so then we go to our four- and five-year-olds, and this is our pre-K and kindergarten class, and this is where they are going to start getting into some of the new curriculum we have here. Uh, and this year, the lead teacher is Andrea Carball. She has been faithfully teaching in that class age, and her assistant this year is Jamie Cox, if you guys can stand for me. From there, we move on to first and second grade. And our teachers for our first, second grade, Lori Weller is our head teacher for that. And Chrissy Weber is going to assist her in that class as well as they lead that class together. So if you guys can stand, I appreciate that. And if you could remain standing, Jamie, if you can. So 
I can call her out. I'm married to her. All right. And then third to fourth grade class, uh, this class, again, new, with the new curriculum, I'm going to go ahead and say that Miss Grace is the head teacher. All right. And Ian is assisting her. So if you guys can stand up, I appreciate that. And then because of the breakdown, our old curriculum had the kids in three grade levels. This one only has them in two grade levels. And so because of that, we had to add a new class and a new teacher stepping up to the plate. And our fifth and sixth grade class, uh, Melinda Simmers has stepped up to lead and be the head teacher of that class. And Miss Carol, who's in the upper room, uh, she is going to be assisting her in that class. And then our seventh to twelfth grade class, which meets down in our youth room underneath the gym. Uh, Miss Tracy is, is, is leading that class with Angie as well. I know Angie's in here and Richard as well, if you guys can stand. And so these are our adults, our children, and our youth Sunday school teacher. Can we just thank the Lord for what they're going to be doing this year? And I, I want to pray for them so you guys remain standing, but I just want to just challenge this again. With all this new curriculum, all this newness that's happening, this is a good time for you to plug in. And so I want to encourage you and your entire family, because we have something for the whole family, to make a commitment this upcoming year and say, we as a family are going to invest our spiritual walk and join in these discipleship gathering classes. So again, if you need any questions, or if you have questions that I say of where exactly these are after service, I'm right by these double doors. I can direct you where to go with that. Let's, let's pray for these folks, and let's pray for our discipleship gatherings. Lord, we just thank you for this time that we can gather. And, and Lord, this intercession prayer is a little different than we would normally do. But Lord, we are thankful for this day and what this day means. We're thankful for the kickoff of our new discipleship gatherings, our new Sunday schools. We thank you for all the, the teachers that we've had stand up here. And, and, and we thank you for their, their willingness to step up to the plate, to serve you, to be used by you. Uh, many of them feel that you know, maybe they don't know what they're getting themselves into. And Lord, that's a great place to be because when we are weak, you are strong. You come through in a mighty way. And so I pray that you would just be with these folks, whether if they're new teachers, new volunteers, or these are folks that have been our Sunday school teachers for years and years and years. Just as we enter into this new season, new curriculum, new studies, new students, just all this going on, a lot of changes, I pray that you would just bless them and guide them. I pray for all of us, Lord, as we join in these discipleship gatherings, that we see the importance and value of these gatherings, that you would ready our hearts to receive what we need to learn, to learn more about you, to dig deeper into Scripture, and to grow spiritually as well. Lord, we pray that as we look back this whole year, and we look back on our discipleship gatherings, we can say that it was all you all you, that there's no glory of us, that we look back and it's testimony after testimony after testimony of your movement in this church family, because that's what we want. We want movements of God, not movements of man. And we pray not only for that in our worship gatherings, but we pray for that in our discipleship gathering, in every gathering that we have, that it's just movements of God. And that's what we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would empower us, lead us, so we can see that type of movements. I thank you for these folks. I thank you again for what you are going to do this upcoming year. Lord, there are some requests that we do want to be faithful in sharing here. We want to continue to pray for Connie Shiflitz. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that she's home. We pray for this test that she's going to be having here this week to see what's going on with our hearts. And we pray that we'll bring some clarity and direction there. We want to pray for, for Kelly Moores and her rotator cuff and the pain that she's there. We pray, Lord, that you would help her. I know she received a steroid shot and it just doesn't seem to be working. And so I pray that you would just give her strength and help her during this time as well. Well, we continue to pray for Troy and all that Troy is going through in his battle of cancer. And we also praise you. We want to praise you for Howie Muma. We've been praying for Howie. That's Darlene's son, uh, Lord. And there has been great reports that Darlene shared with me this week. Some awesome praises. He's about 95% healed from his accident that he had, his four-wheeler accident. And so we just thank you for that and what you're doing there. We pray that you would just continue to minister and help him and that you would use this time this time that he's been through, to draw him closer to you, Jesus. That is our ultimate prayer. Jesus, we're so thankful that you never leave us nor forsake us, and we close this prayer in the same way that you've taught your disciples to pray, using the word debts. Our Father, the Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You guys can be seated. Thank you so much. We gather here to worship the Lord through many aspects, and one of those aspects is our tithes and our offering. This is a spiritual act of worship. Our tithes go to the work and the ministry here at Salem Reformed Church, and our offering goes above and beyond our tithes. You can read in your yellow insert today where your offerings, obviously our continued support with Amelia. We had a great mission dinner last night where we talked about Springfield, Ohio. We talked about the Ecuador mission trip and all that we've learned from Amelia. And then this month, our local organization that we want to support, nonprofit, is Children in Need. And so we're supporting them here today. Uh, but there's also an additional offering uh, that we want to invite you, if you want to give, if you feel the Lord given you to give in this situation. Uh, Madison has shared with us that there's a young uh, former student of hers had a very tragic fire uh, over the course of this past week, lost everything. The family is in need of clothes, food, etc. cetera. Uh, so the Mission and Outreach Committee, Eddie, uh, he's going to mention this and talk with this, but the plan is the Mission and Outreach is going to be doing something to help them, whether if it's a gift card or whatever it may be. And again, this is something that you're going to talk about a little bit later this afternoon. But that said, if you were to come alongside the Mission and Outreach and give financially, in addition to whatever they decide to do, we want to open up that door for you. And so simply put, if you want to you know, either just make cash, give cash to Eddie so he could put it towards the mission and outreach. That's one way. Eddie, if you just want to raise your hand back there to know who Eddie is. Uh, or if you want to write a check to Salem Missions, you could do it that way. It'll go right to Salem Missions and they'll know how to do and what to do with it. And so we're just, we want to invite you if you feel led uh, to help out in that. That's, that's great because I know they're, they're going to talk about doing something. So we want to open up to the whole congregation. And, and all that we do here, why we do these things, is an act of worship to God. And to make sure that we have a heart of worship when we give our offering, we always like to stand and sing a song. And we're going to sing today the great doxology. So let's stand and sing the doxology together. We praise you, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. We praise you and give thanks for the opportunity to give our tithes and our offerings here today. We pray that you would bless these gifts, Lord. May they, may you use them to be your hands and feet, to, to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we pray that you would give leadership, wisdom, and discernment on how to use these gifts. We worship you through them, and we love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And children, won't you come up to the corner here? Appreciate your patience as we have our children's sermon for today. All right, well, good morning, boys and girls. How's everyone doing? Good. Let me ask you a question. Do you like following rules? No. No. Yes, no. Let me ask you another question. Does your mom and dad at home have rules? Yes. Yes. All right, that's a good resounding yes. Why do you think mom and dad have rules? So you don't get in trouble, right? You learn important lessons. And you stay safe. Why else do you think? Don't get hurt. So you don't get hurt, right? So you stay safe. That's exactly why your parents give you these rules. So that you can stay safe and that you can learn. You can learn how we're supposed to be, right? Do you know that God gives you rules? Oh, man. He gives us rules. He does. You're going to learn about those rules, the Ten Commandments here today. But God gives us these rules not because he's like, you have to do these rules, this is what I say. But he gives us these rules because just like your mom and dad, he wants to make sure that you stay safe 
And he wants to make sure that you stay out of trouble, that you do the things he wants you to do, that you worship him, that you love him, and that you serve him. And so at Children's Church today, you're going to be learning about these rules that God has given you, okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we could be here today. I just thank you for the rules that you have in our lives, these Ten Commandments. I pray for the children as they get ready to learn about these Ten Commandments, that they will learn what it means. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, hold on, whoa, 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 whoa. Before you guys go, I don't have candy today, but I have something special and something different. Last night, all everyone that came to the mission meeting got one of these brands. Yeah, you're wearing yours. I'm wearing mine as well. These came right from Ecuador, and I have some extra for folks who weren't here last night if you want to get one. But for you, you know how you guys bought all that candy during VBS for the children? And I don't know if you know this, but your mom and dad and so many adults gave money so that when we go down there, all the money that we, we brought down paid for their VBS and their paint and the crafts and all these things. They were so appreciative of you and what you did that the children got you guys something from Ecuador. There's these little pouches. You could put change in here. Whatever you want to put in here, you can. So each one of you is going to get one of these, all right? So I'm going to give one to you. I'm going to give one to you. So not candy today, but one of these special gifts from Ecuador I want to give to you guys today. And uh, those who are a little bit older for Children's Church, if you're wondering, hey, where's mine? I got you. I got plenty here. Don't worry. Didn't forget about you. No, thank you. No, thank you. Are you sure? Just take one. It's okay. Just take one. Just take one. You can put marbles in it, like Miss Jamie said. But again, this is from the kids all the way down from, from Ecuador. They got this for you guys, all right? Well, hey, have a great children's church. See you later, guys. If there's a couple kids down there, yeah. morning, Salem. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, please turn with me to Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47. If you do not have your Bibles, that's okay. Grab a black pew Bible, should be one in every pew, and uh, turn with me to page 1090. Here is the reading of God's word. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had things, all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Here ends the reading of God's holy and perfect word. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Joe. I encourage you folks to keep your Bibles open to that passage of Scripture as we look at that a little bit closer this morning. Uh, here we are. We are, believe it or not, in week number five already in a series that we've been doing called Acts, You Shall Be My Witness, verse by verse, chapter by chapter study uh, in the book of Acts. And as we share the attention of this particular series, why we feel the Lord has led us to preach this series, to go nice and slow through the book of Acts, is we as a church are in this season where we're trying to explore and embrace, right? You don't want to just explore and end at exploring. You don't want to just discover it. We want to live it out. So explore and embrace what it means to be a missional church, where we have, as we said, a missional church is where the great commission of Jesus Christ is in everything that we do. Yes, it's in our missions, it's in our outreach, but it's also in everything. It flows to all ministries, and it flows to all people, that we as an entire congregation are on a missional mindset. We're on a missional living. So that's what we've been talking about here in this series. Uh, what Joe read for us here today is it, it's an interesting aspect of passage because what we see here is what is known as a kind of a transitional piece of this book in the book of Acts. Uh, we see that we see this phrase, so then, in verse 41 as things start off here. 
And Luke, as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, is showing us here that we are in a transitional components. And so far, what we've looked at in Acts chapter 1, verse 1, to Acts chapter 2, verse 40, in many ways was kind of the intro of this book. And in this intro, we see, as Jesus promised, the giving of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. We see in the very parts, uh, first parts of this book that Jesus is still here. He's still on earth. He's with his disciples. And he tells his disciples to go and wait in Jerusalem and receive the Holy Spirit. And the power will come upon them, and they will be his witnesses. We will be his witnesses of all Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We see in that introduction that Jesus then is ascended miraculously up into the clouds, now sits at the right hand of the Father. We see in the introduction that the disciples who now are obedient to God stay in Jerusalem in the upper room for 10 days. And it says that they prayed and they seeked out the word of God as they waited. And we see in this introduction that on the day of Pentecost, the Pentecostal feast, the Holy Spirit comes down as promised by Christ and indwells upon the believers, given birth to the church. The church was born on Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, ushering, finalizing the new covenant that Christ has established. So now we see the birth of the church, and now we see the establishment of the church as we see the 120 disciples who have received the Holy Spirit start to speak in different languages and the gospel being proclaimed in different languages. And then eventually in verse 14, Peter stepping up and utilizing what has all transpired as an opportunity to preach the first ever sermon in the church and point to Christ. And it ends this introduction with the people who've heard the sermon say, what shall we do to respond? And his answer was, repent and trust in the Lord. And it ends there. It ends there. And that is the introduction that, that Luke, as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, lays for us as we see the birth and the establishment of the church. And we have this transitional piece, and we're going to find different other transitional pieces as we read along in this book. But we see the first transitional piece here. The introduction, the church is born, the church is established. Now we're going to move forward, really for the rest of this book, we're going to see how the Holy Spirit went from bringing the church into existence by his power to now leading the church with his power. And leading them particularly to fulfill Acts 1 8, that they shall be his witness, and we with them shall be his witness of all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the introduction is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that brings birth to the church. And now, as we see this transitional piece, so then the rest of this book, we're going to see how the Holy Spirit empowers and leads this church to fulfill the mission that God has for them. And the very first thing that we see revealed to us as we now see the Spirit of God lead the church, the church is in existence now, the very first thing is we see how the church gathered, how the church lived its life together. And we see three key priorities in this passage of Scripture. And I want you to understand that these three priorities that the Holy Spirit made as an emphasis for this church, it was the Holy Spirit who led them to make these priorities. This wasn't a, a church committee that sat down and said, okay, what are our three main priorities as a church? What do we want to highlight as a church? What do we want to do as a church? No, these three priorities are spirit priorities. The Holy Spirit led them to live out these priorities. And the three top priorities we see here, it was, that it was a church that grew a church that cared, and a church that declared. And these three priorities that the Holy Spirit led this church to operate in was not just a one-time deal or a cultural thing of just those who existed during this time when the scripture was written. But these three priorities are universal. Universal in meaning this, that those three priorities are the same priorities that the Spirit of God wants for church today even here at Salem Reformed Church. His priority is not how much money we have in the bank. His priority is not whether or not everyone's happy. His priority is simply this. Are we growing spiritually? 
Are we caring relentlessly? And are we declaring boldly? That's it. That's the priority of the Spirit of God within the movement of the church. And so today's big idea, there's one statement that we can go home and just allow the Holy Spirit to work on our hearts. It's this. The church is the people of God who grow, care, and declare for God. The church is the people of God who grow, care, and declare for God. So we're going to break this big idea into two portions, essentially. We're going to talk about the church as a people of God, and we're going to talk about how the church is called to, we are called here to grow, care, and declare for him. So verse 41 here, the church is a people of God. Joe already read it, but I'm going to just go through it again. So then, those who had received his word, what word? It was the word that Peter was just preaching on. The word of repent and trust in Jesus. The word that, listen, this Christ who you crucified, resurrected, he is the Messiah. He is the way of salvation. There's no other way. There's no other gospel. We read Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. For those of you who are doing our Bible reading and playing at church, Paul is very clear here that the only gospel is Christ. Any gospel that's not of that, even if you tweak it just a little bit to please man, is a false gospel and is a curse. There is one gospel, and it's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And so there's this one gospel, repent, believe, commit. That's what he calls them to do. So they receive that word. They are baptized to show their commitment to Christ. And that day, they're added about 3,000 souls. Verse 47, I just want to kind of skip ahead to verse 47 real quick. Second half of that, it says, And the Lord was added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We see very clearly that the church is not brick and mortar. The church is not committees. The church is not finances. Because none of that stuff is even here. They don't have a church building yet. They have apostles, but they haven't established church leadership. There's no, the establishment of deacons comes later. There's no committee. There's no formality. There's no money yet. There is just people here. And that's what the church is. The church is the people of God. That's it. And what's interesting here, a couple things from verse 41, if we read it in conjunction with, with verse 47, which we should. Number one, it says that there were 3,000 souls added that day. This 3,000 souls mean that there were genuinely 3,000 people that got saved that day. Many of you know Billy Graham and his crusades, very well known. Many of you probably watched some of his crusades on television when they were aired on television. Billy Graham, a couple years before he died, this was after his ministry, was being interviewed. He was asked, what was your greatest joy? What was your greatest regret of your ministry? He said his greatest joy of ministry was just the fact that he got to have his ministry, that God allowed him to preach the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to, to, to people and to nations. He went to foreign nations and preached the gospel. And then it was, he said, it was all God. There was nothing I've done. It was all God to give me this opportunity. He said that was his joy. He said his regret, and this is him. This is not me bashing Billy Graham. This is him saying this. Is that out of all the millions of people that came forward during the altar calls and all this during his crusades, he said, in reality, only about 10% who came forward are actually saved. What we have here is not 3,000 people who profess, who walked down an aisle and professed their life to Christ. These are 3,000 souls genuinely saved. But we see in conjunction with verse 47... That is the Lord who added to their numbers, right? Because in verse 47, we see even after that, each day, day by day, it was the Lord who was added to those numbers, those who be saved. It is the Lord who saves. And I, and I want to emphasize this this morning because I want to take a burden that may be on our chest right now. Because ever since we started this series in Acts, we have been really hitting hard that we are all, all Christians called to be missional. We're all called to evangelize. We're all called to be witnesses. It's not just leaders. It's not just the Billy Grahams of the world. It is all of us. We are an evangelical reformed church. Reform means just our theology, you know, the doctrine of grace, the five solas, etc. Evangelical means this, that we are evangelical in nature. It means we wanted to evangelize in nature, which means this. We believe there's a gospel message. There's a message that the nations need to know, and we cannot just sit on that message. 
However, when we hear series like this or sermons like this, like we have to be missional, we have to be evangelical, we get convicted in our hearts and we leave here, and what happens is we start to put unnecessary weight on our shoulders and on our chest thinking, we now have to go out and save everyone. I gotta save my family, I gotta save my coworkers, I gotta save this person, I gotta save that person. And I share this with you here today just to let you know, even as we talk about being a missional church, what we are not saying is that it's this church's responsibility to save people. It is God's responsibility to save people. And his sovereign plan, through his irresistible grace, by his unconditional election, it is God who saves. Period. Now, on the flip side of that, we hear this, and maybe we do breathe a sigh of relief, like, okay, it's not me that has to save. But that doesn't mean now we can become spiritually lazy and not be a witness of Christ. We can't just sit back and say, oh, well, God's sovereign plan, he's going to save people, he's going to add to the church, we can just sit back and relax. No, because in God's sovereign plan, through his irresistible grace, by his unconditional election, he desires to use the church. Pastor Bill talked about this last night in our missional dinner as he closed things out. Pastor Bill said, listen, God could simply just do miracles to draw people to him. He could send angels down to come and preach the gospel. But God desires in his sovereign plan to use the church. Case in point, look what happened in the introduction of Acts. We see that, yes, it was God who added to the number. It was God who saved. But he saved through the preaching of Peter that he empowered Peter to preach. And God used the church to draw people in and to save. And so, yes, it is God who saves, but in his sovereignty, desires to use the church as his instrument, as his vessels, as his instrument to see those who are far from God come to God. So we see here in, in verse 41, the church is the people, and God is the one who builds upon this church and desires to use the church to expand the church. Then we get into the church life itself. What did church life look like? What were these priorities? Well, as we said earlier in our big idea, these priorities are grow, care, and declare. This is the priorities of the Holy Spirit within the body of Christ. This is really the emphasis and, the, and really the reason why we have the Holy Spirit, church. We have the Holy Spirit to grow spiritually. God has given us himself to grow spiritually. God has given us himself so that we could be the church and care for one another. And God has given him himself so that we collectively as a church can declare and have the, sh the glory of God shine through the church so that those who don't know Christ will know Christ. First we see that he grows the church spiritually. Verse 42, they, continually, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. So we see that the Holy Spirit leads in a way to bring forth spiritual growth within this church. This is what we start to see early on here in the biblical church. God he is sovereign for every word that's in this scripture. And God had a plan to show us here very early on what the church was functioning like under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And one of those ways that the Holy Spirit moved this church was to be a church that grew. Now the question is, how did he have the church grow? How was the church growing spiritually? Well, we see it here in these two verses that I just read to you, and these are universal as well. Number one, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The word devote there in the Greek means to dedicate. They dedicated everything they had to the apostles' teaching. You have to understand something. These Christians were formerly devout Jews. They converted to Christianity. They believed that Jesus is the Messiah that the Old Testament points to. And like many devout Jews during this time, they had daily Bible reading plans. They read the Torah. It says in Psalm chapter 1, which they would know very well in Psalm 1, that we are ought to read and meditate on the word of God both day and night. And these Jews took that very seriously. And so in addition, these Christians, to their daily Bible reading, in addition, we see that when they came together, they submitted and received and devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. 
This is addition to their Bible reading. Martin Luther, who obviously we know was, a, was probably the, the, one of the main reasons why we've had the Protestant Reformation. He got it all started. And one of the problems that Martin Luther had with the church during the time was that the church very, very proudly taught that you don't read the Bible on your own. That you just listen to whatever the pastor says, whatever the minister says, whatever the priest says. Listen to what we say. Don't read the Bible on your own. And Martin Luther obviously changed that. Protestant Reformation came in, and that paved the way for our own opportunity and ability to read Scripture alone. But even if Martin Luther were to be here today, he would still say, though he's grateful that we have Scripture, and that in this Protestant movement, we all at home read our own Scripture on our own. We read our own personal time. He'd be encouraged to hear that. He'd be encouraged to see the fruits of the work that he did stepping up. But he would still stand here and say, but listen, as a church, we still need to submit to the teachings that the church has. And that doesn't just mean a 30 or 35 minute sermon on Sundays here. That's not the devotion they're talking about. If, if I could just be honest with you, I get very frustrated at times. Frustrated when I see after church people just walk into their cars and not go into the discipleship gatherings. I get frustrated because I know there's a whole lot more people that could be coming to the midweek gatherings on Wednesdays. And I'm, and I'm cautious to share this because at the same time, I don't want you to go to discipleship gatherings or midweek gathering out of guilt. Because that's not the proper place to go either. But I do want to share this to be transparent with you. That what I mean by frustration is that not in a very negative way. Like, I'm not frustrated like I'm angry, right? That I'm angry that you're walking into your cars or something like that. I'm frustrated because I know the potential of these discipleship gatherings. I know the potential of these midweek gatherings. I know the potential of sitting in God's word, sitting under teaching, and studying God's word together. You cannot spiritually grow in discipleship on just one 30-minute sermon a week. We do need the discipleship gatherings. I need the discipleship gatherings. We need the midweek gatherings. Youth, you need the youth ministry. Seniors, you need the start ministry. Grief share, even that ministry focuses on scripture as well. We don't do these things just to fill a calendar and make us feel good as a church. We do these things so that we can devote to the teachings and grow spiritually. And that's why I get frustrated Again, not in an anger way, but in almost a heartbreaking way. Because personally for me, it's like, where are you going that is more important than staying and studying God's word? We devote ourselves to these teachings. We grow spiritually in these ways. And then we see the breaking of bread. In fact, the breaking of bread is found twice in this passage. We also see it in verse 46 as well. It says, and the breaking of bread from house to house. Now, this word breaking of bread in Scripture is used in two ways. One way is used that we just have a meal together. We just share in a meal together. That's what breaking bread means. And another way, breaking bread means communion. That when the disciples got together, when the church got together, when they broke bread, they broke bread in the sense of communion. Interestingly enough, we see here in this passage that this breaking of bread actually means both things. In verse 46, breaking of bread means fellowship. It means that they had meals together, much like we had last night in our mission dinner. But the other breaking of bread that we find in Scripture is communion, and that's what it means here in verse 42. This means that when they got together, not only did they listen and submit to the apostles' teaching, but they also broke bread. They took communion together. Now, spiritual growth doesn't occur just because we drink some juice and take a piece of bread. That's not what this means here. Spiritual growth occurs because of the meaning behind communion. And what is the meaning behind communion? Remembering what Christ has done. Being centered upon him. That's spiritual growth. And so how did the Spirit lead them? He led them to be devoted to teaching of God's Word, and he led them to be Christ-centered. We also see that there were prayer, that they prayed corporately. 
Praying is important and a vital aspect to spiritual growth in any church. This is something that we as leadership are praying into, and and we have some plans on the horizon here to take our prayer ministry to the next level here, to have more corporate prayer, more prayer services, more intentional prayer, because we believe, as Scripture teaches here, prayer is important. We Notice here, a a few weeks ago, we saw that before the Holy Spirit came, the apostles, uh, the disciples were in the upper room, and what were they doing? They were praying. Now, when the Holy Spirit came and the church was, was born, it wasn't like they stopped praying. All right, we pray for the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit's here. We're going to stop. No, even more with the Holy Spirit within them, they're praying even more now corporately together. And then we see this idea that, verse 43, they were in a sense of awe of many signs and wonders that were taking place. They were a sense of awe of these signs and wonders you know, I think we could get bogged down with signs and wonders. Should signs and wonders be in the church today? Yes or no kind of deal. And again, we miss the meaning of this. What is a sign and wonder? A sign points to God. A wonder makes you wonder in awe of God. So what's a sign and wonder? A sign and wonder is where God gets glorified, where God gets magnified. What is the Holy Spirit? How does the Holy Spirit grow his church? He grows his church so that they are glorifying God, magnifying him, serving him only. We see that the church is a church that grows. And how does the Holy Spirit grow the church? And this is still relevant today. Through the teaching of his word, through the Christ-centeredness, through prayer, and through a church that glorifies God. My friends, if if we want to see spiritual growth here, that's what we need to do. The teaching of God's word, prayer, Christ-centeredness, and God receiving glory. These are the ingredients, and I hate to use that word, but these are the ingredients that lead a spiritual growth. We see not only do they grow, but they care. I don't need to expound on this. It's pretty self-explanatory. Verse 44 and 45, and all those who believed were together and had all things in common. What does that mean? They were together and had all things in common. That's what that means. And they began selling their property and possessions. What does that mean? Is that they began to sell their property and possessions. And were sharing with them all who might have need. Again, this is very self-explanatory here. It was a church that genuinely, authentically cared. Now, in my four and a half years here at Salem, if you were to ask me the question of these three priorities of grow, care, and declare, and you were to say, all right, your synopsis, your review of the church, which Which one does the church do best? I think two and three kind of changes depending on what our season is at church. But one has stayed true. And the one thing that I believe that this church has done the best since I've been here is the care part. The relentless care. We've heard testimonies after testimonies after testimonies of the care that this church has for one another. Now, are we perfect at it? No. In reality, we're never going to be perfect in any three of these. We're never going to be perfect in our growth. We're never going to be perfect in our care. And we're never going to be perfect in our declare. And reality is we're not going to be perfect until Jesus returns. Though we're good at this, obviously there's always room for growth. But if I want to encourage the congregation today, and this is something that I've recognized, but my wife Jamie has also recognized as well. In fact, we kind of recognize it right from the get-go our first weekend here with you. Even in that short weekend, we recognized there was just something different about this church for their care for one another. That they are willing to lay it down. And I just pray we don't become complacent. We do a good job at it. May we not become complacent. May we continue to seek the Lord and even grow and become even better. But I'll tell you, one of the things I hear all the time in, in new membership class, when we ask people, you know, what got you to church here? And you know, why did you keep coming back? You know, one of the things I hear a lot is just that when I first got here, I can just sense the care. You walk in this room, you sense the care of this church. And I praise the Lord that that is a strong thing that we do, but I also pray that God would lead us even more into that. So a church that cares. And then lastly, I'll do this real quick, a church that declares, verse 46, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread. That's not the breaking bread communion. That's breaking bread and that they were just having meals together. From house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. A few years ago, 
I was reading the book of Acts for personal reasons. There's books in the Bible that I read personally, and there's also books in the Bible that obviously I read more of study and professionally. Like right now, I'm reading Acts with you all as well as I prepare sermons. But personally, I'm reading Galatians in the morning with you all, but I'm reading the Gospel of Mark at nights. So I was reading Acts personally, and I, became, I came upon this verse in verse 46, and I've read this verse before. I've taught on this passage of Scripture before. A lot of pastors teach on this passage. It's a very popular passage to preach out of. And as I was reading this verse, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, it, it just really kind of came upon me, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't taking this out of context, and so I looked up other and comic commentaries that maybe I've never looked before, and I found that there are some other people who have, who have seen and believe this is what's saying as well. It's easy to read this and think day by day they went to the temple, and we're thinking that go to the temple to worship. But they're not going to the temple to worship. In John chapter 4, when Jesus was approached by the Samaritan woman, and the Samaritan woman says, where should we worship? For your people, the Jews, say we should worship in the temple. But my people, the Samaritans, says we should worship in the mountain. Where should we worship? Jesus' response to the woman says, the hour is near. In fact, the hour is here that you will no longer worship in a temple or in a mountain, but you will worship in spirit and truth. Jesus telling us that worship is not confound into a temple anymore, but worship has now expounded. Also, in addition to that, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies into all the other roofs in the temple was violently split in half. Why? To symbolize that God's presence is no longer in the temple. And we see it. On Pentecost, God's presence is among his people. So much to the point that the Apostle Paul says that you and I are the temple of God. We're literally walking temples of God. Not only that, all Old Testament sacrifices, whether grain or animal, all point to Christ. And Christ fulfilled it all on the cross. If Christ didn't fulfill it all on the cross, then the cross is not sufficient. And all is not finished. But Christ fulfilled all sacrifices. So, listen, they're in the new covenant now. The presence of God is with them. They don't need to go to the temple to seek God's presence. They don't need to go to the temple to worship God, and they sure don't need to go to the temple to make sacrifices, because Christ is their sacrifice. Why are these new converted, new covenant Christians going to the temple? It's pretty easy. The temple is where people are going to seek God. Because some Jews still think the presence of God is in the temple. And they're going to the temple to seek or worship God. And you want to talk about a prime area and location to go and preach about the Messiah. And that God's presence is no longer in this building, the temple. But God's presence is everywhere and can dwell in within you. If you surrender your life to God. They went to the temple not to worship formally, but they went to the temple to declare the good news of God, which is a form of worship. Declaring is a form of worship. They went to the temple to declare. They opened up their house. It doesn't say that it was just Christians that met from house to house. It doesn't say that. We just assume it whenever we read this. They opened up their house for people to come. And what? It says in verse 47, you have to read all this together because it's all one big sentence. We can't split it. But there's so much danger when we look at these verses and we split verses up individually. Read it together. It says that they found favor with people, with all people. Well, listen, if they found favor with all people, that means they had to interact with all people, not just the church. It's not just these little click of people that are now just together and they don't interact with them. No, they're intentionally going to the temple. They're intentionally opening up their homes to those who don't know Christ yet as Messiah so that these people can know who Christ is. And through their proclamation and God using the church, God, in verse 47, added to their number day by day those who are being saved. A church that grew, a church that cared, and a church that declared. These were the three priorities of the Holy Spirit in the early church, biblical church here. And they ought to be our priorities here, true church. If we start putting stuff on top of that, we're losing our vision. 
We're losing. In fact, our vision statement, which is found in your bulletin, you know, a gospel-centered church that serves in, right, cares, builds up spiritual growth, and reaches out like Christ. We didn't just make that up. It's from Scripture. It's the priorities of what we should be doing. That we would be a church that grows spiritually, cares relentlessly, and declares boldly. And as we take communion here this morning, may this be a start of this. May, may we say as a church, we want to be this church. We want to be the biblical church that Scripture is clearly painting out. The priorities that the Holy Spirit has, not our priorities, but the priorities of the Holy Spirit. The priorities of the God who laid down his life for me and that loves me. These are his priorities for us. As we go to this table and we remember Christ, that we become Christ-centered, May we remember and desire, may we remember the desire that Christ has, that we will be a growing church, a caring church, and a declaring church. The church is the people of God who grow, care, and declare for God. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts for communion. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather here in your word. And as we now transition from your word to table, we pray, Lord, that you would minister and speak to us, guide and lead us. May this time of communion have a center upon you, Jesus, and you only. May we be centered upon your will, your desire, what you want from this church, Lord. And I just confess of times that I've gotten in the way. And I stood in the way of your spirits. I pray even for me that you would humble me, put me in my place. I long just to live for you, and we long as a church to live for you. So as we center upon you upon this table, we only want to live out your priorities for the church, not our priorities, but yours. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. I encourage you, if you're able to take out your uh, white insert there, that you see the communion liturgy, you can follow along here with us. Some of it will be up on the screen, too, as well. If you don't have one of those inserts, that's fine. just want to remind everyone here at Salem Reformed Church, we have an open communion table. What this means is that if, uh, doesn't, if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, even if you're an uh, official member of our church or not, uh, we believe that because of your faith in Christ, you are part of the universal church. Um, and so we invite you to take this meal with us here today. If, if you're new with us and don't know how we do communion here, uh, we're going to have our ushers go around. They'll, they'll pass around the plates with the bread. You just hold on to that little piece of bread. When everyone has a piece, I'll instruct us to eat, and then we'll do the same thing. A little cup of juice. It's not wine. It's a little cup of juice. We pass that around as well. You just hold on to that juice until it's time, uh, and I'll, I'll let you know to leave. Church, our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, instituted holy communion of his body and blood that it might be the abiding memorial of his atoning death, the seal of his continuous presence in the church through the Holy Spirit, the mystical representation of the sacrifice of himself on the cross, the pledge of his undying love for his people, and the bond of his living union and fellowship with them to the end of time. Those who have earnestly searched in their own heart and desire to forsake all sin and follow after Christ and his leadership are invited to partake in this holy and precious meal. Therefore, Salem, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You have formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made a covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke through the prophets. Church, to help prepare our hearts to receive this holy meal today, let us pray together our confessional prayer. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. 
we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Church, I hear, invite you to hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us in the name of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. And to anchor into our forgiveness and to know that our redemption is through the works of Christ and through the works of Christ only, let us together recite and proclaim the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born on the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. On the night that Jesus was handed over for suffering and death, we remember that while in the upper room, during the supper, he took the bread and thanked the Father for it, and then turned to his disciples and broke the bread and said, Take and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the supper, we remember that Jesus then took the cup, again, th thanked the Father for it, and again turned to his disciples and said, Take and drink, all of you, for this cup is my blood of the new covenant that was shed for you and for many the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. It's all Christ. It's all Christ. Bless you.
body of Christ given for us. Let us eat with a humble heart. Blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Let us drink with a grateful heart. We're going to close a little differently than when our bulletin says. We're not going to do our last song and all the things that we do, mainly because this is uh, kickoff Sunday for discipleship gatherings. We want to make sure that we have enough time for those classes here today, our teachers to get down there. And honestly, I think at this point, just with the message today, it's just, it's just a good to end in reverence of this communion meal, of being Christ-centered. And so we're just going to end. I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to do the communion prayer. I'm, I just feel the Lord lead me to do another prayer. So will you all stand with me as we close out our time in prayer? Lord, as we come to you, and thank you for this time of worship here today. We thank you for the church. The church is only here because of you. By your spirit, you gave birth to the church. By your spirit, you established the church. 
by your spirit, you now empower the church to be what you want it to be. Lord, we understand that the scripture that we read today, how the church lived together, was not just some ideas that if we want to embrace, we can embrace. But this is in your word for a reason. For you desire to move in the same way that you've done then as you do now. Nothing's changed with your church because nothing changed with you. You are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Your priorities of the church has always been the same spirit of God. That's for us to grow spiritually, grow intimately, grow deeper in our walk with you, to grow spiritually, to care and be one another. This is why, Lord, you've given us the church so that we don't do life alone. We can carry one another's burdens. And then to declare because we know that we have the gospel message, the only good news. And far be it from us to just hold on to that news, Lord, and not share this with with this, this city and this state and this nation. And so continue to use us, empower us, give us boldness to declare. We thank you that we are only here today because of you. Even the breath of our own lungs is by you. We, we have done nothing to get to this point. And we don't want to be a people, therefore, that just live lives for what we want. And we certainly don't want to be a church that just lives the way we want church to be. Help the Spirit of God to submit to you, your will, your plan, your sovereignty of your bride your body, the church. Thank you for this communion meal. Thank you for allowing us to remember that everything is all on you, Christ. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, and amen.